英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com How do you know my name? asked Tildal. It's not surprising, said the blue child, considering that I shall be your brother. This time, the live children were absolutely amazed. What an extraordinary meeting. They must certainly tell Mummy as soon as they got back. How astonished they would be at home. While they were making these reflections, the child went on to explain. I am coming to you next year, on Palm Sunday, he said. And he put a thousand questions to his big brother Was it comfortable at home? Was the food good? Was daddy very severe? And mummy? Oh, mummy is so kind, said the little ones. And they asked him questions in their turn What was he going to do on earth? What was he bringing? I am bringing three illnesses, said the little brother. Scarlatina, whooping cough and measles. Oh, that's all, is it? cried Tylebel. He shook his head, with evident disappointment, while the other continued. After that, I shall leave you? It will hardly be worth while coming, said Tylebel, feeling rather vexed. We can't pick and choose, said the little brother, pettishly. They would perhaps have quarreled, without waiting till they were on earth. If they had not suddenly been parted by a swarm of blue children who were hurrying to meet somebody. At the same time, there was a great noise, as if thousands of invisible doors were being opened at the end of the galleries. What's the matter? asked Tyldall. It's time, said one of the blue children. He's going to open the doors. And the excitement increased on every side. The children left their machines and their labors, those who were asleep woke up. And every eye was eagerly and anxiously turned to the great opal doors at the back, while every mouth repeated the same name. The word, time, time, was heard all around, and the great mysterious noise kept on. Tyldal was dying to know what it meant. At last, he caught a little child by the skirt of his dress and asked him. Let me be, said the child, very uneasily. I'm in a hurry, it may be my turn today. It is the dawn rising. This is the hour when the children who are to be born today go down to earth. You shall see. Time is drawing the bolts. Who is time? asked Tyldal. An old man who comes to call those who are going, said another child. He is not so bad, but he won't listen or hear. Beg as they may, if it's not their turn, he pushes back all those who try to go. Let me be. It may be my turn now. Light now hastened towards our little friends in a great state of alarm. I was looking for you, she said. Come quick, it will never do for time to discover you. As she spoke these words, she threw her gold cloak around the children and dragged them to a corner of the hall, where they could see everything, without being seen. Tylthal was very glad to be so well protected. He now knew that he who was about to appear possessed so great and tremendous a power that no human strength was capable of resisting him. He was at the same time a deity and an ogre, he bestowed life and he devoured it. He sped through the world so fast that you had no time to see him. He ate and ate, without stopping. He took whatever he touched. In Tauble's family, he had already taken Grandad and Granny, the little brothers, the little sisters, and the old blackbird. He did not mind what he took joys and sorrows, winters and summers, all was fish that came to his net. Knowing this, our friend was astonished to see everybody in the kingdom of the future running so fast to meet him. I suppose he doesn't eat anything here, he thought. There he was. The great doors turned slowly on their hinges. There was a distant music, it was the sounds of the earth. A red and green light penetrated into the hall, and time appeared on the threshold. He was a tall and very thin old man, so old that his wrinkled face was all gray, like dust. His white beard came down to his knees. In one hand, he carried an enormous scythe, in the other, an hourglass. Behind him, some way out, on a sea the color of the dawn, was a magnificent gold galley with white sails. Are they ready whose hour has struck? asked Time. At the sound of that voice, solemn and deep as a bronze gong, thousands of bright children's voices, like little silver bells, answered. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And, in a moment, the blue children were crowding round the tall old man, 
who pushed them all back and, in a gruff voice, said. One at a time. Once again, there are many more of you than are wanted. You can't deceive me. Brandishing his scythe in one hand and holding out his cloak with the other, he barred the way to the rash children who tried to slip by him. Not one of them escaped the horrid old man's watchful eye. It's not your turn, he said to one. You're to be born tomorrow. Nor yours either, you've got ten years to wait. A thirteenth shepherd? There are only twelve wanted, there is no need for more. More doctors? There are too many already, they are grumbling about it on earth. And where are the engineers? They want an honest man, only one, as a wonderful being. Thereupon, a poor child, who had hung back, until then, came forward timidly, sucking his thumb. He looked pale and sad and walked with tottering footsteps, he was so wretched that even time felt a moment's pity. It's you, he exclaimed. You seem a very poor specimen. And, in a moment, the blue children were crowding round the tall old man. And, lifting his eyes to the sky, with a look of discouragement, he added. You won't live long. And the movement went on. Each child, when denied, returned to his employment with a downcast air. When one of them was accepted, the others looked at him with envy. Now and then, something happened, as when the hero who was to fight against injustice refused to go. He clung to his playfellows, who called out to time. He doesn't want to, sir. No, I don't want to go, cried the little fellow, with all his might. I would rather not be born. And quite right too, thought Tylville, who was full of common sense and who knew what things are like on earth. For people always get beatings which they have not deserved, and, when they have done wrong, you may be sure that the punishment will fall on one of their innocent friends. I wouldn't care to be in his place, said our friend to himself. I would rather hunt for the blue bird, any day. Meanwhile, the little seeker after justice went away sobbing, frightened out of his life by Mr. Time. The excitement was now at its height. The children ran all over the hall, those who were going packed up their inventions, those who were staying behind had a thousand requests to make. Will you write to me? They say one can't. Oh, try, do try. Announce my idea. Goodbye, Jean. Goodbye, Pierre. Have you forgotten anything? Don't lose your ideas. Try to tell us if it's nice. Enough. Enough, war time, in a huge voice, shaking his big keys and his terrible scythe, enough. The anchors weighed. Then the children climbed into the gold galley, with the beautiful white silk sails. They waved their hands again to the little friends whom they were leaving behind them, but, on seeing the earth in the distance, they cried out, gladly. Earth! Earth! I can see it! How bright it is! How big it is! And, at the same time, as though coming from the abyss, a song rose, a distant song of gladness and expectation. Light, who was listening with a smile, saw the look of astonishment on Toddle's face and bent over him. It is the song of the mothers coming out to meet them, she said. At that moment, Time, who had shut the doors, saw our friends and rushed at them angrily, shaking his side at them. Hurry, said Light. Hurry. Take the blue bird, Toddle, and go in front of me with Mytel. She put into the boy's arms a bird which she held hidden under her cloak and, all radiant, spreading her dazzling veil with her two hands, she ran on, protecting her charges from the onslaught of time. In this way, they passed through several turquoise and sapphire galleries. It was magnificently beautiful, but they were in the kingdom of the future, where time was the great master, and they must escape from his anger which they had braved. Mytel was terribly frightened and Toddle kept nervously turning round to light. Don't be afraid, she said. I am the only person whom time has respected since the world began. Only mind that you take care of the blue bird. He's gorgeous. He is quite, quite blue. This thought enraptured the boy. He felt the precious treasure fluttering in his arms, his hands dared not press the pretty creature's soft, warm wings, and his heart beat against its heart. This time, he held the blue bird. Nothing could touch it, because it was given to him by light herself. What a triumph when he returned home. He was so bewildered by his happiness that he hardly knew where he was going, his joy rang a victorious peal in his head that made him feel giddy, he was mad with pride, and this, worse luck, made him lose his coolness and his presence of mind. They were just about to cross the threshold of the palace, 
When a gust of wind swept through the entrance hall, lifting up Light's veil and at last revealing the two children to the eyes of Time, who was still pursuing them. With a roar of rage, he darted his scythe at Tyltal, who cried out. Light warded off the blow, and the door of the palace closed behind them with a thud. They were saved. But alas, Tyltal, taken by surprise, had opened his arms and now, through his tears, saw the bird of the future soaring above their heads, mingling with the azure sky its dream wings so blue, so light and so transparent that soon the boy could make out nothing more. Audiobook. Living in Kyoto by Hidemi Woods. Now on sale in online stores. 44 available distributors. Apple, Google Play, Amazon Audible, or else. ヒデミウッズがデザインしたとってもかわいいオリジナルグッズが手に入るトートバッグ缶バッジステッカー T シャツトレーナーパーカー文具その他いろいろエリゼンドットコムで見てみてね「ERIZEN.com」「ERIZEN.com」エリゼンドットコム。英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング。英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロード。その他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます。88thpp.com。88thpp.com。